Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Project Knative Maintainer session, where you are not going to hear from maintainers this time around how great Knative is, but hear about the stories how Knative fares in the real world. I am Naina Singh. I am Knative Steering Committee member, and today I have with me four guest speakers who are going to talk about what, how they are using Knative in the world. So. If you attended one of my previous sessions, you will think that I'm repeating myself, but I think it is worth repeating that Knative is more than serverless. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, in Kubernetes, to create and deploy a service, you have a lot of constructs that you need to keep take care of, to create, to configure, to deploy. What Knative does, it takes away the cognitive toil that you need to have because you run a command on a container it gives you a ready-to-use URL with auto-TLS and also provide you auto-scaling based on demand with infamous scale back to zero. And that makes it a serverless platform for Kubernetes as well as a simplified Kubernetes for application developers. But that's not all. It is also event-driven platform for Kubernetes because it provides you the eventing infrastructure for your, all your event-driven needs. And with one more, what I want to say is, if I can reduce it to tagline, it is Knative by default and Kubernetes when you must. So today we will learn from our guest speakers their use cases, what scenarios they are using Knative for, and why Knative. And with that, I am going to give it to my first guest speaker to kick it off. So I'm Andrew Sanatar, and um... I work for CoreWave, who's a GPU-focused cloud provider, so HPC rendering, sort of things like that. And we use Knative for a managed service that allows our customers to run serverless-style workloads. Most of our customers are using Knative to serve large language models and like image generation. And one of the reasons they like to use these is because of the ability to scale up and down, scale to zero. These are very big features that they want. Some of them deploy a lot of fine tunes that don't get a lot of usage. So scale to zero is pretty important. So Knative Serving provides a very simplified deployment for them, and it handles the scaling, the ingress, everything, all in one. You can set this up, and we have seen some customers do this manually with like K to Auto Scaler and whatnot. But this is so much easier for them to manage and use. You get the one CRD. So that's the really big driver for uh, the Knative usage there. And we have a lot of clients using it. We have thousands of K services over with lots of pods. So I'm gonna talk about a few challenges we've had through our usage. We've actually had a really overall good experience, but there's a few things that we've kind of learned from it. And I just kinda wanna highlight some of those. So the activators for Knative serving, we've chosen to manually scale them versus using the HPA. We found in our large cluster with our thousands of services, that that extra kind of churn of the endpoints can cause some less than optimal behavior. We've seen this in the past from other speakers as well. Uh, we've increased our activator capacity again per activator because we found a lot of our services have very cyclical uh, views and that helps it churn less on the endpoints. We have a lot of dashboards to monitor the health of our cluster there to make sure it's performing well. We run a dual ingress with Knative, so we run both Courier and Istio. Uh, Courier is great for what we need. Istio was kind of used at the time before Courier existed. It's a little heavyweight for our usage, and we've seen better scaling with Courier. Um, that was something that kind of came through. You know, we've had some bugs in the past with the activators not detecting pod readiness and whatnot. We've worked through those. Those are patched now. And, you know, occasionally with very large clusters, you can run into some slowness here and there. Uh, that you just kind of have to manage. Uh, there's some things we've done to improve that areas where there's a slowness, but overall it's been very robust on the control plane side. On people using K services, um, we have have a really good experience with Knative, but not all our customers are experts in deploying Knative services. So some frequent things we see is a lot of our customers, especially with large language models, you know, they tend to have very large containers. They tend to put their models in their containers. They pull their models from Hugging Face and they expect all this to scale up and down quickly. It doesn't. So <laughs> we've done a lot of training and whatnot with our customers, helping them, you know, go from long container start times, well over five minutes, you know, down to 30 second start times or less. 
uh, we, our infrastructure is set up to kind of optimize some things, so we kind of steer them towards how we have things in place there. Uh, other things, some again, not every customer is an expert at Knative or how to configure the service. So we've seen like incorrect container concurrency. LLMs, a lot of times, you have one GPU assigned to your container. You can handle one request at a time. If you set your container concurrency to zero or 40 in Knative, you will have problems because you'll queue in the queue proxy and a lot of your requests will time out. And then you'll come to us complaining, why do we have all these failures? And I'll say, well, you kind of misconfigured things. Uh, so we've seen a lot of things there. So sometimes a lot of the like challenges we face with Knative aren't really challenges with Knative thing. It's a lot of the understanding with our customers and whatnot. So we've got a lot of docs for our internal support people to help our customers through things, as well as we have public docs on our doc site for best practices for inference and serving. So that's kind of how, that's where a lot of the focus has been with like I'd call issues and problems. They're not really issues and problems. They're just getting the right understanding on how to use the tool to do the right job. So I'm gonna hand it over to the next guy. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so my name is Norris Samosarenko. I work for SVA, um, a German-based um, IT infrastructure and consultancy company. And um, yeah, I'm an architect, mainly dabbling uh, currently in OpenShift, Kubernetes, and distributed systems in the public sector. And we are using Knative mainly for the eventing component um, because we have clients who have like multiple departments and they have many monoliths which they are now transforming into cloud native applications. And this provides a big um, overhead and a communication problem inside the organization. So we have chosen to use Knative eventing to like decouple the applications and provide like a platform software as a service experience to the different departments that are residing in the client side. Um, one problem that we of course face is that we cannot use something that is SaaS and cloud-based because we have high compliance um, standards. So we have to choose something that is very um, standardized, has open standards, and can last maybe decades. Or we can think it can last decades, at least. That's what we hope for. And uh, we came to the conclusion that Knative is here the best fit. It uses like open standards, um, like cloud events. Um, and the interfaces and the architecture is very stable and good design. So the end users that we will deploy Knative to, they just have to interact with very simple and straightforward interfaces and can rely that they always work, irregardless if they're having a developer experience inside the cloud for just development and then going into high site where it's air-gapped and secured. Um, so the goal, in essence, is creating a big magic event mesh as a software as a service that we can deploy on-prem and the users can interact with through the broker and trigger model. Um, on the right side, on the, on the picture you can see here, it's like a high-level overview of what we are doing. So we have multiple Kubernetes clusters, and um, we, are, uh, we are putting a load balancer in front of these clusters. And through the load balancer, we address one of our um, Knative brokers to then ingest the events that are coming to the system. And through that Knative broker, we call them the cluster Knative broker. We then load balance these um, or forward these events to the other uh, clusters, which we then call the follower clusters. And from there, the projects then get their namespaces. They can apply for a namespace or departments, and they can just publish their workload applications into their namespaces, and then also consume the Knative services. So for example, the broker or trigger model, which is backed by Apache Kafka in our case. Um, we have some requirements in regards to that, which are specific to the public sector, which is like we have to, we have some environments which are low side, we have some environments which are high side, so air gapped environments and specific uh, compliance uh, standards we have to agree to. Firewalls are a huge issue, custom certificate authorities and uh, multiple clusters, many stages, different uh, data centers which are also secured in a weird way, which are not usual in the um, open market. So um, this is all things we had to consider when deploying Knative at the customer side. <clears throat> Challenges we saw during the build up and the implementation were mainly with the persistence. So at least back then in the documentation, uh, the documentation and the details about how the persistence and e.g. for example Kafka or RabbitMQ is implemented into Knative wasn't as straightforward as it is now. So the documentation is much more better now in that regard, but we had to figure out a lot of things on the go. 
Um, and that's the second point about the sparse docs. There were, there were some issues we had to find out through looking to the GitHub code, but which is all now covered as well in the documentation. And for our case, for example, is the custom certificate authority, which we had to inject into all the pods that call like consumers, because our services that we call our deployments, they all have custom certificates included into their image. Um, on the user side, end user side, one challenge is we are working in the public sector. You can imagine pay is not that good, so the engineers that are there are not really the engineers that would be confronted with cloud-native computing tools, solutions. They usually have like multiple years of experience at that client, and they're used in their stack, so it's maybe .NET, Java, and not much out of that, because getting new tools into that environment is kind of tricky. So we, the onboarding part was a big, big um, yeah, effort on our side. We had to redocument everything. We had to go through a lot of work or workshops with the users, and as well the architectural uh, parts like um, item potency, at least once delivery. We had to explain those concepts very much, very often um, in detail, so that the users understand what they are really doing. Um, we had to create a default Grafana dashboard which is currently not included in the upstream project because this then allows the um, consumers to really see on one page what is happening in their system end to end and identify, for example, issues in their system and then go to Jaeger to trace them down. And on the GitOps side, we had some issues, especially in the administration part, where we deploy a lot of like broken triggers and when we update the cluster and all the departments are already deploying their stuff, while that is happening, the reconciler sometimes gets some hiccups and uh, yeah, it leads to weird issues, let's say like that. So we are still working to finding out what exactly kind of issues we are getting, but uh, um, yeah, that's something that we are still not sure what is the reason on that end. Um, error messages as well are sometimes not that descriptive, so especially in the controller level, the control plane, um, there might be some error messages you might see if you use it in production where you really have to drill down and sometimes also go to the GitHub Go code to figure out what is happening here because you get the Go code line, the exception, but the error itself is non-descriptive, something like context that like exceeded, doesn't tell you much. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the challenges we had. We all um, faced those challenges and also found a fix to this, but that's just something to keep in mind. On the usage side, Knative is very easy to use and it has simple interfaces. On the administrator side, um, you have to be very knowledgeable in all the systems you are using, be it Kafka, RabbitMQ, Knative itself, Kubernetes, how Kubernetes works, the programming lang languages that are being used in the context of the uh, customer. So it's very, I guess, you have to have a broad skill set if you want to deploy it as an admin. <clears throat> a recommendation from my side is load and chaos test um, your Knative deployment very uh, from the start. So uh, use something like Chaos Mesh, uh, um, use something like K6 or what we used was a hyperfoil, I think we used it to test it and get some histograms to see how it works in your system. Do some back of, back of the envelope math to s figure out what is your throughput with your Kafka so that you get a realistic estimate of the boundaries you were going to push. Um, if you are in a regulated environment like public sector compliance, think about that in the beginning, not at the end, or you will face problems. Um, and um, yeah, consider self-service. So enable the users that they can do it themselves and just help them on the knowledge part. Developer experience is key. Um, that is what we found out. So make it even easier than the normal docs and tools are doing it. Create something that is uh, unique to the customer experience or the environment that you're working in. Um, keep an issue log about all the infrastructure things you're finding. We have a structure for that. We always document root cause, assumption, solution, and ticket link. Um, optimize the workflows if you have shared responsibilities and create a unified observability plane above all your services, especially in the event part because you are then working with distributed systems. So that is the recommendations I can give. And uh, yeah, give it a guy. try. Try out Knative. Um, so far for our use case, we are very happy with it and um, we are surprised that we could set up something like this in a very highly regulated environment. So yeah, that's for my part, thank you.
Um, there is a use case study on this K-Native eventing on CNCF website. This is the QR code for that, and I'll upload the slide deck later, so do check it out. All right, so I, I guess I'm next. So my name is Ricardo. Uh, I'm a computing engineer at CERN. I'm also in the TOC and the newly formed technical advisor board of the CNCF. I'll give, like, I, I guess everyone knows more or less what CERN is about, but basically we are a large physics laboratory and we have large requirements in terms of data storage uh, and also analyzing processing the data. So we, we keep looking at all sorts of technologies that can help us uh, today and in what's coming in a few years as well. Uh, so we've been using K-Native for inference uh, for quite a while, um, also via Kubeflow. Um, we have uh, strong requirements in, in, in terms of uh, machine learning that are uh, speeding up pretty quickly. I'm sure everyone has been hearing about Gen AI, LLMs, but actually there's a lot more around machine learning that was there uh, more than a year ago, uh, even more than 10 years ago. So these things um, are just uh, becoming more relevant, but, uh, but they've been there for a while. So. Um, the requirements we have for this sort of services that we, we run are integration with GPUs. This has been a big thing since, uh, since a while. Uh, and also uh, the integration with uh, better ways to improve uh, GPU utilization and efficiency, concurrency. Uh, things like NVIDIA, time slicing, MPS, make uh, all these sort of things. And for us, it's very important to have a platform that uh, gives us uh, easy access to, to the sort of things like the and with the GPU operator, which we already use elsewhere as well. So in the, in the right side, you see a, a picture of uh, multiple models being served. Uh, the fact that we can actually use uh, even different backends for, for the serving is, is quite, a, quite relevant. Uh, K-Native also gives us a, an easy way to, to manage those services, versioning, rollouts, rolling back as well, giving different endpoints to, to people as well, auto-scaling, and I'll talk a bit about that. And this is what we've been using basically in production for, for a while. Uh, there are other use cases that pop up uh, that are quite interesting. So I'll talk about two of them. The bottom left one uh, is about the, basically the key uh, use case we have at CERN, which is when we, the data comes in, we get what we call raw data and we store it in a backend. In this case, I put CFS3, but it can actually be, uh, the actual storage system is not today uh, CFS3, but for this data. But I give an example because this is the use case we have. So we would push the raw data and we'd rely on events on the S3 side to trigger um, um, the analysis, the first step analysis that would generate something we call ESD, which is event summary data. And this would generate output that gets pushed again into our backend storage. This triggers another event that gives the next step, which is the AOD, which is the analysis object data. And this is what then gets pushed to the uh, physics groups. So this, this sort of uh, uh, way to do workflows uh, is actually quite interesting because we can manage the, the processing part uh, on the server side instead of having to write, republish the software to run the workflows on large scale batch systems and give users the responsibility of maintaining those. So there's, there's a nice use case there to follow. It is not in production, it's something we keep uh, trying and we still don't have it figured out. Then the other one is GitLab CI. Uh, there's a lot of requests for, to do more than what you can do uh, with continuous integration uh, when it's integrated in the repos uh, and to do, use those webhooks and triggers to, to uh, use managed services that can be again versioned and managed elsewhere. So those are the two we're looking at. Uh, regarding challenges, so again we do machine learning. One of the big issues, if you've, I've given a couple of talks about this as well elsewhere, but we have very large images. Um, these are not necessarily uh, machine learning models, but just the software we manage. Uh, image distribution is a big thing. For this sort of uh, serving um, um, use cases, it's even more important because you want the, the starts to be pretty fast. So the images have to be either pre-distributed, but if you have several versions of software like this, you're talking about potentially terabytes of data that have to be in, on the nodes. So we've been looking for a few years into this sort of lazy pooling, uh, where you just, instead of pulling the full image and starting the service, you actually start immediately and you pull the files you actually need at runtime. And there's some nice integration in Containerd. I put here an example. The benefits are dramatic. You can see the improvement on pulling times uh, from minutes to just a few seconds. 
and then the execution, the the ingress is also very important. We we move a lot less data around, so so this this makes a big difference. Uh, the challenge, another challenge we have is that we actually don't have a big use case for service mesh elsewhere. Um, so we had to learn Istio uh, when we started looking at it, um, just for the specific use case. So the knowledge about uh, this tool is not necessarily spread across the teams, uh, which makes it a bit harder to, to manage uh, when, when we have incidents. Uh, the other challenge we have is that the remote serving is often done in air gap environments close to the machines. Uh, so this is not a use case we've explored completely, but it means that we have to have some sort of offline replication of, of the things that need to be served. Now the, I'll finish with the the needs that we see for, for our use cases in the future. So we do have a lot of uh, ML coming, uh, bigger bigger models. Until now, we actually didn't have that big models. Uh, we start having a lot of bigger models, but also uh, the, some of the ML use cases, they actually rely on the container to have the model, but they rely on a lot of external data that is not inside the container image, which means that all these benefits that I mentioned before of optimizing cold start, um, it may become an issue when actually you're pulling uh, gigabytes of uh, additional data at, at, at start. So this becomes a, quite a big issue. It's not something that uh, the traditional container or OCI registry really handles. So it's something that the community, not only Knative, will have to figure out. Uh, the other one is very large models. Uh, we traditionally had pretty small models, I would say. Some of them start being big enough to not fit in memory on a single GPU. So something that also, again, this has to be figured out how, how we'll handle this kind of use case properly. Uh, the other one is we want to make the best use of GPUs, so um, making sure that they are not idle, uh, that when they are claimed by a, a serving component, that actually we can run more than one workload maybe on the same GPU so that we don't have them idle when, when things are just hang, hang, hanging there waiting for new requests, even before they are cleaned up for being idle. Uh, so for GPUs, we've been doing things like MIG with partitioning, slicing, slicing, but there are challenges because um, um, unless you do physical partitioning with MIG, memory sharing is not obvious. So uh, we are looking into things like the uh, DRA in Kubernetes that uh, is kind of promising for this. Uh, the other one is multi-cluster. So we are by design multi-cluster uh, on-premises because we have this requirement of different types of resources that are located in different areas. Uh, but also we want to burst and scale out to uh, public clouds and to give a good experience to our users uh, while trying to do deployments that cross administrative boundaries is not obvious, uh, especially because Kubernetes was not designed from the start to be multi-cluster. So scheduling is kind of still a big issue that we have to figure out. So it's not, again, a particular issue for Knative, but I think it's something that Knative will have to integrate properly to, to serve these use cases. And with this, I pass to. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Adolfo Garcia Beitia. I am an open source engineer with ChainGuard. Uh, uh, we are a supply chain security company. For those who are familiar with the supply chain security space, what we do is we protect you from uh, to make sure that software that you ingest uh, is safe to run and it's, it can be safely used to build your applications on top of it. Um, so obviously that involves lots of open source. Um, and as part of that, uh, we use Knative to power all of our sources, all of our services. So. And so I'm going to give you a brief overview of one of our services, which is uh, ChainGuard Enforce. Uh, ChainGuard Enforce is our um, supply chain security uh, uh, control plane, if you want to uh, see it like that. Uh, ChainGuard Enforce performs many functions. Um, it, uh, the way it operates is that it uh, observes the workloads in your cluster and uh, it reports back what you're running. And based on that information, we perform a lot of uh, uh, it has a lot of features to act on that. Uh, so it can do uh, from security scans, it ingests test bombs, uh, it will tell you what's running where. It can. It also does uh, multi-cluster, um, multi it has multi-cluster capabilities and, uh, and you're gonna see how we do it in a little bit. So those services, all of them, 
are powered by Knative servers uh, serving. Um, the most, uh, we, uh, our uh, Chang'e Enforced practically has no um, role deployments. Uh, all, of our, all of our services are uh, deployed as uh, using uh, Knative uh, serving. Um, and this includes around 30, 35 features that um, include all of those uh, things like uh, like like the uh, like those mentioned that I, I mentioned before. Um, now uh, we also use um, uh, eventing, uh, and eventing is wired uh, to report back to the users uh, all of the all of the events that we uh, detect in your clusters. So, for example, when we uh, perform a vulnerability scan on your workloads, uh, we use eventing to send uh, the notifications. Uh, back to the user and to the console. Uh, we also um, we also uh, use uh, eventing for the lifecycle notifications of our admission controller. So we have Enforce Scan um, has an admission controller that lets you uh, admit or deny workloads based on uh, policies that you define in your uh, that you define. Uh, for each of your workloads, uh, and you will use eventing uh, to communicate all of those. Um, now, inside of your cluster, we uh, this is optional, but we can run um, an agent, and that agent is uh, built. Uh, it's the one that observes the running workloads on your clusters and reports them back to uh, to our SaaS. And that one is built using the Knative controller framework. Um, and so uh, we discussed uh, talking about uh, some of the challenges. Um, you, inside of Chingard, we have uh, lots of Knative expertise. Um, this, uh, and uh, I'm, tr I try I'm trying to collect what I heard from our engineers um, in one single slide. Um, and this boils down to one thing. Um, so in, in the main problem that we have with Knative when running it was uh, making sure that the RabbitMQ broker was doing what we wanted it to do. Um, so uh, the, main the main problem that we faced was that uh, interacting with uh, the project can be a little bit slow. Uh, we, we are proud to be serving back, uh, uh, submitting back contributions to the project, uh, but uh, the, the broker is in a, I don't know, in, in need of help. Uh, so when trying to find more documentation, when trying to uh, get advice from the maintainers, it has been some, a, a little bit of a problem. Um, some of it has to do with the fact that uh, Knative abstracts a lot of things for you, but it also has to make sure that the RabbitMQ backend is running properly, so it has to take care of a lot of things. But when you have to fine tune the, the features in the in the in the RabbitMQ backend, sometimes it's difficult. You have to deal with annotations, and uh, it can be difficult to pass them to the backend. So um, at this point, I would like to. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention is. I have, uh, this year I had the privilege to serve on the Knative Steering Committee, representing my company uh, in the end user seat, um, uh, together with Nina. And um, so uh, I wanted to finish on this line because I would like to like open uh, the call for participation in the project. Uh, so if you are a Knative user, uh, you can do lots of things to help the project, starting with uh, helping us track you. Uh, we're interested in hearing from you, uh, hearing who's using it and how. But more importantly, try to approach and see some of the uh, help, some of the issues that are outstanding. So, while things can work very well, uh, we need your help to make them easier to run. Um, so, with that, I pass it to Nan. Thank you. For me, learning about that. Knative was serving AI ML long before they were mainstream was the, was the key with certain use case. Um, but I found those end users from every part of the world, like eventing use case, serving use case, and everything. We do have some time if you have a couple of questions to our end users. If you have Knative related questions, please find us on CNCF Slack, but you might not have access to the end users. So if you have 
questions for them, we can take them right now. But I would ask you to come to that mic over there so that we can actually hear the questions and record them. So, yes. <laughs> All right, just hang on. Yes, uh, my question is for Norris. You mentioned that the reconciler has issues with uh, changes to Knative resources. What were those, and are those things that anybody that uses Knative needs to worry about? Mm, it depends on your deployment, I guess. Uh, so how many? So I think we have a unique com combination. We deploy and all the projects deploy all their stuff with Argo CD. So you can imagine we are talking about maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of custom resources um, that might be changed during the reconciliation loop. And we specifically have that problem usually with the Kafka controller somewhere. So we think it's pinpointed somewhere in the Kafka reconciliation when we change stuff. Um, but it's very hard to debug. As I said, the error messages are not very descriptive, and you have all this um, layering. So you have Knative, the eventing core mechanism, then you have the Kafka controller, then you have Kafka itself. So to pinpoint very clearly what happened where is kind of tricky. Um, so we are still figuring out what really is the reason. It could also be our deployment or our Kubernetes configuration in the end. But currently, we are sure it's more a Knative issue. And since there's no other questions, I'll ask another one. This is to anybody. Um, what's often touted as a, as a huge advantage of Knative is the ability to scale to zero. Um, but what I'm wondering is when you get into a production environment, I understand that maybe in development and in early stages, this is great because I can scale completely to zero. But in a production environment, I can see if I have like CoreWeave's use case, this might be super useful because a customer only wants to run a, an ML pipeline once a day or something. Um, but uh, in larger production environments where I'm constantly running uh, or doing work, um, is scale to zero really that valuable? Yeah, so like some of our customers scale to zero doesn't do them anything. They're, they're setting their min scale to, you know, five, 50 nodes, five nodes, 100 nodes, however many pods, you know, they need to run their back end. Other customers, like I said, they do fine tunes and fine tunes are very specific. And so they have a tendency to allow scale to zero because they're okay with that startup time uh, given that they have, you know, hundreds of these fine tunes sitting around, they don't want to be paying for all those resources when no one's using them. And so they've made the trade-off decision that, like, they're okay with the startup time. These customers have generally done good with optimizing their startup time. So we're not talking like five, ten minute startup times. We're talking about sub 30 second startup times. Uh, they're okay with that trade-off. And so there are use cases that we see some customers in production utilize it. A decent bit and other customers not at all so it's it's very use case uh, centered I will say the functionality in Knative that allows scale to zero and allows the queuing in the activator is also very useful for burst so while your containers are spinning up especially with long container start times if you get hit by a lot of requests the same thing that allows scale to zero handles burst and queuing so like that being built in like that functionality and that core functionality helps you out even if you're not using scale to zero, uh, I guess is what I'm saying. So it, it does a really good job of handling long container start times where you need to buffer thousands of requests before you have containers ready as well. Uh, Thank you. I'll just add, if you don't want in production cases, you can always keep scale to one. But that was a good, do we have one more question? Yeah. Hi, uh, my question is for Ricardo. Um, you had shown that you have a um, multi-step physics models that you run. Um, there are a number of different ways you can um, do that. Um, why Knative? And is, are there just specific use cases you use it Knative for? And um, Right, so maybe I go back to that slide quickly. Uh, so you're talking about the bottom left, is that it? Yeah, so that's kind of a still experimentation we are evaluating for, for this sort of use case. Uh, this is not for physics models, this is for workflows to, to do what we call event reconstruction, which is when the data comes from the detectors. It needs, like we have the raw data, and we need to do the reconstruction to see what hap actually happens uh, happened in the collisions. So this is uh, some workflows that we have for 20 years in place, and the way we usually do this we, is we deploy some sort of batch workflows on a DAG, 
but the software that is being run uh, has to be managed by the physics groups, uh, by the people submitting the jobs. They need to describe the jobs, which versions of the, the software should be running for those workflows. All the steps have to be defined. So, but the main motivation for this is that the components doing the data collection, they will just store it, and this will trigger events that trigger the reconstruction steps, the, the proper ones, and also the actual reconstruction software is now an endpoint, an HTTP endpoint, where the, what is running there is managed by a system administrator and can be described in, uh, in Git, and we can do GitOps for that. We don't have to teach the users how to build their workflows and which versions to use and all these things. We can do, as we do for services, we can actually offer them a workflow, an easy way to implement workflows. Now, if this will actually be used at scale, we don't know because people are already used to, to, to using large batch systems, but it's a very interesting use case. And, and building complex workflows with this sort of eventing model, event and serving, is actually quite easy. And you can, you can describe it in a declarative way, so it, there, there's some value there, I think. Great, thank you. And I love the energy, though. <laughs> Uh, and we are out of time. I'm just gonna. This is our uh, QR code. You know where to find us the CNCF Slack, Google Groups, and um, we have a lot of tutorials there. And if you're still with us, if you could leave uh, feedback on our session, that would be great. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the KubeCon and safe trip back home.